Well, we'll get into the message today. It's, it's, uh, we're starting a new sermon series. It's all things new. It's called Fight the Good Fight, Persevering in the Mission. And we're going to read out of Acts chapter 19. If you could put that on the screen for me. I'm actually going to read it off my phone if that's okay. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 20. God was performing extraordinary miracles by, the, by Paul's hands, so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incant- incantation whatever it's saying, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Now, I don't know about you. I've seen people get beat up. But I've never seen somebody get the clothes beat off of them. Like, <laughs> like seven people. This one guy beat up seven people. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to the Jews and Greeks alike. And solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. So Paul's out preaching Jesus, showing people through demonstration that Jesus is not some distant God that's not wanting to be involved in our lives, right? He's demonstrating that Jesus came to heal He came to help. He came to be an aid. He came to come alongside. He came to be involved in your life that He's a personal God. He's not some distant God that never talks to you. He came came to show that Jesus cares, right? And the name of Jesus was becoming so popular that people that did not even know Him were trying to use His name. And I actually have a funny story about this. I asked Kurt if I could share it and my wife, so if it's not appropriate, it's their fault. Um, So these three ladies knew this young man that had got into some trouble and had had a bad run-in with some drugs and some different things and became a paranoid schizophrenic. Like he wasn't like this before, but then he was like this all the time after that, a paranoid schizophrenic. So they decided, well, he's got demons. So we're going to go cast them out. So they get together and they go up there and, and pray over the young man and, and he's in his little schizophrenic state and nothing happens. And they pray in Jesus' name come out and nothing happens. So they, one of them gets the bright idea, I know what we can do. They said, what's that? They said, we can call Rob. He'll cast these demons out. Now I don't know where they got this idea. I don't come off like that, do I? <laughs> so I go up there because I'm willing to try anything once. And... So I go up there, and it's a bad part of town, and the house doesn't look real fancy, and, you know, it's the neighborhood you lock your doors in, and you hope your window doesn't get broke out. So I go in the house, and every light in the house is off except this one little lamp in the corner. And I'm already uncomfortable, so I'm thinking, why are all the lights out? You know, like, turn the lights on. I'm already freaked out. You got one little light in here. Every light in this house should be on, right? So I go in there and and we start talking and then we get to where we're praying and I start to pray over this young man and he starts to get physically agitated. Like you can tell something's not right. And he began to get aggressive. And then he began to yell. I'm not telling you all the details because the children in the room. But he began to yell some things you probably shouldn't be yelling. And it got pretty hectic. And then he looked at me like he went, and locked eyes with me. And I had two thoughts in that moment. The first one was, I wonder if I have another pair of shorts in the truck. (laughs) 
The second one was this story we just read in Acts. I thought, I'm about to get beat up. Like, I'm serious. You guys think I'm joking. I, was about, I thought, I'm going to get beat up. Like, the book of Acts is about to happen right now. Well, anyway, that didn't happen. We prayed, and, and anyway, the guy calmed down pretty quickly, and, and it seemed like things went well. We, we called the name of Jesus over and commanded him to come out, stuff like that. And so the cool thing about it, and then I left. The cool thing about it was two days later, I was at the airport in Indianapolis about to fly to Florida. And this young man, I was in the, the line for Chick-fil-A at the airport. And this young man came walking right by. He didn't even know I was there. I watched him walk right by me in his right mind, talking on the phone, joking around and laughing on the phone. A free man walking right, right, right down the, the pathway. Isn't that amazing? But my point is, is that these people tried to use the name of Jesus. They said, come out of him in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. So that tells me they didn't know Jesus. And, and many of us know people that believe in God, but, but they don't know Him, right? Like, like they believe in God, and, and you have friends, you have co-workers, you have even family members that believe in God and maybe even believe in the Bible. But they don't have a relationship with God. Like, like they stopped at just believing in Him, right? They, they don't go to church, they don't read their Bible, they don't fellowship with other believers, they're not on mission with Christ, but they believe in God. And, and I think the reason why that is, is, is point number one, if you could put point number one on the screen, your concept of God. When somebody talks about God, what do you think about? Now, I'm talking like, what kind of character does he have? What kind of person is he? What's in his heart? What's his outlook on life? How does he view people? Like, who is God? Your concept of God. I think that's why people stop at believing in Him because they have a concept or a belief system about God that's not a biblical belief system. It's not the definition of God that God gave Himself. It's, it's, if we're not careful, we allow movies to try to tell us who God is. We allow books other than the Bible to influence who we think the God we worship is, what kind of person He is. Uh, we allow people to speak into our lives that have a strong opinion about God, but they don't even know God. Let me say it like this. We allow people to speak into our lives about a God they don't even know. And we tend to believe what they say. Maybe we don't mean to believe it, but it happens in life, right? Uh, let, let me say like this. Uh, if you have the belief system that God is critical, you're not going to want to draw close to somebody who's critical. Uh, if you think God's judgmental, you're not going to open up your heart to somebody that you think is not going to treat that with care, right? If you think God, you, you actually guard yourself in the workplace from people that are critical. You don't expose the secrets of your life and open up and draw close to somebody that's critical or judgmental. If you think God's a mean person, you're not going to draw close to a mean person. You'll stop at just believing in Him. Like you'll believe He's real, but you won't form a relationship with somebody you think doesn't care about you. Um, let me say that this, it's, it's hard to rest and relax in the presence of someone that you think always wants you to do something for them. Like God's some kind of a taskmaster. Uh, like you have to perform in front of Him all the time. You have to wear a mask. You have to try to be somebody you're not. People come to church, they wear their best because they're, you see, like they can't be themselves. If you think God is, is performance based, like his, his love for you and His care for you is based on how well you're doing. You see, if, you have a, if your belief system about God is that, you're going to stop at just believing in Him. You're not going to form relationship with Him. And, and I want to say this, sometimes we allow circumstances of life to define who God is. So like, if life's going well, God's good. If life's not going well, well, God's mad at me and He's not so good. So we allow life to define God rather than allowing God to define God. 
And I want to say no one can teach you about God better than God can. This brings me to point number two. It's one word. It's Emmanuel. I know it's not Christmas time, but Emmanuel, the meaning of the word Emmanuel is God with us. See, God gave a correct view of himself. We don't have to question who God is or what's in his heart or what what kind of character does he have. We can know God if we know Emmanuel. God with us. Uh, Turn to that next scripture in Colossians chapter 1. Is there a Colossians chapter 1? Okay, great. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So I'm talking about this invisible God that, that spoke the world into existence. Like this invisible God that created the, the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. That created the air we breathe. That created man and woman in the beginning. That created the, the animal kingdom in the symbiotic relationships. I'm talking about this invisible, somewhat mysterious God that spoke to a man from a burning bush in the Old Testament. Like, like the God who created a religious system to where one man could enter the holy place once a year. And he better be cleansed himself or he'll die when he walks on the other side of the curtain. You see, this, this invisible, somewhat mysterious God of the Old Testament where we can pull out and say, well, we see how he dealt with Gideon, so we think God's like this. We see how he dealt with Rahab or, or, or Ruth or David, and we, we, we pull these things out of these different stories and we form, this is, this is who God is, this is the kind of character he has because of these stories. But I, I'm saying this is Christ is the visible image. He's what you can see. He's what you can put your finger on. He's what you can relate with. He's what you can point to. He's the visible image. He came to display and demonstrate who this invisible, somewhat mysterious God of the Old Testament is, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's put that on the screen here. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. That's Old Testament, right? And now in these final days, He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. When, when we, who is God? What kind of character does He have? Well, we don't have to look anywhere else. We look to Jesus. Again, and this is another translation of verse 3, the sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature, His mirror image. So we, we understand that Jesus came to die. That's Christianity. He came to take the punishment for our sins upon Himself and to die in our place, right? We understand Jesus came to die, but what I want to stress today is He also came to live. He also came to demonstrate who God is. I mean, he's the one that brought the revelation of God as Father. No one referred to God as Father until Jesus came on the scene. And not only did he teach that God is a Father, he taught he's a good Father. Like like he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He's a good Father that's involved. Every hair of your head is numbered, right? Uh, If you being good know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? So he brought the revelation out that God is good, that he's a father. John 1.18. Just a couple more scriptures here. No one has ever seen God. I looked that word seen up in the Greek. It means to comprehend with the mind. So it could literally read, no one has ever fully comprehended God. The only son who is truly God and is closest to the father has shown us what God is like. So... Like, Kurt can't go around every day and teach us about who God is. Like, when life happens to us and tragedy strikes or we get a diagnosis, whatever it is, and life happens, and we need to, in that moment, we need to pull on the character of God, uh, Kurt can't be there to teach you who God is. But if you can catch the revelation and the understanding that Jesus and the Father are one, then we've done our part. You know who God is because you know Jesus. 
And no one can teach you about God better than God. I have one more scripture, John 14. Nora, one more scripture, John 14. If you had really known me, you would have known my father, who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. So he says, just bring the father down here and that will be enough for us. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still do not know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So why are you saying to show him to you? Or why are you... Why are you asking me to show him to you? So I want to close with this story. Um, A little while back, I was sitting at a church, a big church in the evening, one evening, and this car comes flying in the parking lot. I'm talking screeching the tires. Makes a U-turn in the parking lot, comes up to the front entrance, slamming on the brakes. And this lady gets out of the driver's seat. And walks around, runs around the car, opens up the back door, grabs this teenage girl by the hand and drags her up in the church. So I come from around the front desk and meet him in the front lobby area. And, and she says, my daughter just tried to kill herself and, and I don't know what to do. And she's pulling on her arm, I raised you right, I can't believe you've done this to me and all this stuff. And I said, hold on, I'll go get one of the pastors and, and I'll be right back. Now, now mind you, there's six pastors on staff at this church. And plenty of other people that could handle this stuff, not me, right? So I go in the back in the staff area, and I check every room. And I check every hallway. And I check the break room. And I thought about checking the bathroom, because I can't deal with this. I've never been involved in anything like this. I don't know what to say. So I go out there, the, the walk of shame, back out there. And I'm praying the whole time, oh God, oh God, oh God, I don't even know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do or say or guide these people. So I go out there and the mom's still freaking out. The daughter has her hood up. She doesn't want to be there. And she's pulling on her arm. And what are we supposed to do? I can't believe she tried to do this. And I said, hold on. Can you go sit across the room? Because she wasn't making any, she wasn't making anything better. She, it's her mom. She's all freaked out. I understand you know, the situation she's in. So I asked her to go sit on the other side of the lobby and that if I could talk to her daughter one-on-one on the other side of the room. We could see each other, but we couldn't hear each other. So she said yes, and she went and sat over there, and we walked over to the other side of the lobby. And I'm praying as we're walking over there, God, what am I supposed to say? I don't even know where to start. She clearly doesn't want to be here. So she sits down, and as soon as I hit the chair... These words came to me so strong. It was, if Jesus was sitting in the chair you were sitting in, what would he say? And the light bulb went off. I knew, I knew what God wanted me to say. Why? Because I know Jesus. I, I see how God dealt with the woman caught in the act of adultery. I see how Jesus dealt with her, right? I see his heart. I, I see how he dealt with the leper. When, when the leper said, if you want to cleanse us, You can. He said, I want to. Go show yourself to the priest. I see how he dealt with the 5,000 that that were following him. He said his heart went out to them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. I see how he dealt with the widow that lost her son. The Bible says that his heart broke for her. I see that he wept at Lazarus' tomb. You see, I, I see the heart of God, and I know God's character and what he's like because I know Jesus. So I said, well, this, I got this then. I know what God would say because I know what Jesus would say if he was sitting here. So I began to explain to her how valuable she was to God. That God looks at her as a daughter. Like I understand that, that people may not show you the time of day or, or that people don't show that they care sometimes, but God's never shown you that. I understand your daddy ran out on you, but God's never left you. You see? And, and that's what I want all of us to realize is the value, the cross of Christ. People say, well, how do I know God loves me? And I say, look at the cross. The cross shows you that God loves you. The cross does not show you how worthless you are. It shows you how valuable you are. 
Like, you don't go to the car lot here in Indianapolis and pay $50,000 for a 1992 Ford Taurus with three flat tires, a busted window, and, you know, all the fender wells. Why? You don't give a high price for junk, right? But you'll spend 50000 on a brand new Cadillac because it's worth it. God did not give the cost of his son, right? God did not pay a high price for something that wasn't worth the cost. So I began to explain how valuable she was to God, and she, for the first time, she looked up at me, and tears were coming down her face. And she began to open up and share things with me that she had never shared with anyone else. And all that weight that she was never intended to carry, that Jesus came to carry that weight, all that weight came off of her. And the awesome part of the story, it wasn't even two months later, this young girl is leading worship on the worship team at that church and singing in front of hundreds of people and worshiping God. Isn't that amazing? You can clap your hands for that. Come on. So, if we could bow our heads in this, I just want to create, try to create a moment for God to speak to us here today. If we could bow our heads and close our eyes. And you may be in here today and, and maybe that you can relate with that young girl. Maybe that's, that's been you. Maybe, maybe you had those thoughts. Maybe you've dealt with the same things she was dealing with. And I want to say to you, I want you to ask yourself this question if that's you today. If Jesus were sitting right in front of me right now, what would he say? How does God view me? I would say he views you as a daughter, as a son, as somebody that's valuable. Or maybe you're here today and, and you say, I, actually, I've just stopped at believing in him. Like, I didn't mean to stop there, but that's where I'm at today. And I want to say to you, listen, God's not mad at you for it. God's ready for you to enter, in, enter into real, authentic relationship with Him. No more holding back, no more hiding, no more concealing the things inside. But, but open your heart before a loving Father that's going to treat that with care. So if that's you today, I just want you to pray with me silently in your heart. Is, is God, I'm, I'm done holding back. I'm done hiding. I'm going to let it all go. I, I surrender to you. I submit my life to you. Everything that I am, I bring it underneath your leadership. And I surrender it all to you today. I know that I'm valuable because I see what you did for me on the cross. I see the price that you paid for me. So I invite you in, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, what a great day. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, as Liz was mentioning earlier about serving in the kids, we want to make sure you know that we have every person that serves go through and do a background check. And we cover that as a cost. We will do that for the safety of the kids um, primarily, not that we don't trust you, um, but we always want to make sure that we have that down, have it under record uh, that we have done that. So we'll cover that cost. I'll send out an email later today um, with some of the updates for the month of August. There will be the ability to reply back, sign up if you'd like. Uh, you can also just go ahead and fill out the background check because that's really like the next step in that. So if you'd like to be a part of Emerge Kids, that would be amazing. And um, that will come out, and you'll see that. We uh, have a, um, a few things that are going on through the next couple months. But the biggest thing for uh, time-wise, and so you know, it will be in the email as well, but for Holiday World, anybody that wants to join us, um, September 17th through the 19th, um, be camping. Uh, on the 18th, we'll be at the park. Uh, so if you guys want to be a part of that, just let me know um, or let one of the – people on the team know that you're interested in going so we can secure the spots uh, also out on donate you can see the place where you can get the tickets um, I'm going to pre-buy all the tickets so once we have everybody signed up committed we'll go and buy it and we get a $25 discount um, by us doing that that way so it's pretty awesome great opportunity for us to connect and do that and 
Um, right after that, the very next week, September 21st, I want you to mark that down on your calendar. We're going to be right here, up here on this level. We're going to pack 10,000 meals to hand out into Hancock County. So 10,000 meals is what we will all pack. If there's more than, um, is it, if there's about 50 or 60 volunteers, we'll be able to do 15,000 meals. And so then we're going to take, after that evening, we're going to take it to all the local Hancock uh, County, which is the county that we're in right here. Uh, we're going to take it to the food banks. There's three of them that specifically serve this area in the community, and we'll be able to provide a meal. So that would be for 10,000 or 15,000 individuals, which is pretty awesome to be able to do that in one night. It's a macaroni meal, uh, nutritious, and able to fill the bellies because that's um, a, a big need, especially here in this county. So anyway, that's it. Hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you around. Thank you. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to Because they can't stay long when I'm here with you It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you And you meet me here today with mercies that are new Oh yeah, and my fears and doubts, they can all come to and doubts, they can all